a brief bio of the Dr. Mir Jalili before starting his talk. So Dr. J Mir Jalili is the director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and Optimization at uh, Torrens University, Australia. He is internationally recognized for his advances in swarm intelligence optimization, including first set of algorithms from a synthetic uh, intelligence standpoint, a radical departure from how natural systems are typically uh, understood, and a systematic design framework to reliably benchmark, evaluate, and propose computationally cheap robust optimization algorithms. He has published over 200 publications with over 22,000 citations and H index of the 53. As the most cited researcher in robust optimization, he is in the list of 1% highly cited researchers and named as one of the most influential researchers in the world by the Web of Science in 2019 and 2020. Dr. Mir Jalili is the senior member of IEEE and associate editor of several leading AI journals, including Neuro Computing, Applied Soft Computing, Advances in Engineering Software, Applied Intelligence, and IEEE Access. His research interests include robust optimization, engineering optimization, multi objective optimization swarm intelligence, evolutionary algorithms, and artificial neural networks. He is working on the application of multi-objective uh, multi and robust meta-heuristic optimization techniques as well. So it is again my great honor to invite uh, Dr. Mirjali to start his presentation. Thank you very much. You can share your slide and start. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Yazdani. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, before I share my slide, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and IEEE uh, Western Australia chapter for uh, the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. I tried to keep my talk a bit short. I know it's Friday evening now. <laughs> After one week uh, of hard work, everyone, um, I don't really want to take too much of your time. Um, well, um, as Dr. Yazdani said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, optimization problems and algorithms. So before I get started, uh, may I uh, check uh, and make sure to see you can see my slides? Um, yes, everyone? Dr. Amir Jalili, I okay. can see and hear your voice as well. Thank right. you. We can keep okay. continuing. All right. Sure. Thanks a lot. And um, just a couple, uh, a, a, a very um, gentle request. Um, or, um, well, you know, it's, it is almost November now, almost December, I should say, and uh, we've been all on Zoom call and team call for the whole year, and I really get sick of no black screen with, uh, you know, white letters and you know, some logos. Oh, if you can share your video, that would be great, so I can see your faces and get some energy. Um, if not, that's okay. Um, I've been dealing with this you know, in my classes and my meetings anyways. Um, but yeah, if you have any question, look, I think uh, because of uh, we've got quite a number of uh, you know attendee, um, we can wait until to the end. Um, but and so keep your question. Make sure to make a note of it so you don't forget it. And then uh, we've got plenty of time in the end uh, to to answer uh, for the question and answer. Well, um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to be talking about optimization problems and algorithms. But before I get started, um, as uh, Dr. Yazdani said, um, I work at uh, Torres University of Australia. Um, it's one of the youngest uh, universities uh, uh, in, in, in the country, uh, and um, I was lucky enough. Uh, well, a lot of academics inherit research teams and research groups, but I was lucky enough to be the co-founder of our um, AI uh, research center. Um, so it, I built my team, and if you look at the name of uh, the center, our, our, one of our AI center is Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and uh, uh, Optimization. So, um, and, and optimization is, is, is the field that I've been working on for a long time, and uh, it's, it's a part of DNA of the center too. And, um, and I believe that, you know, we are moving to industry 4.0 now, and optimization um, will be playing a key role, um, you know, uh, in, in that space. And um, we've got a lot of um, people now with a machine learning background and AI background, um, you know that you know, all the learning techniques, most of the machine learning techniques rely on optimization. So it's like an engine, an analogy will be an engine, you know, as the main driver for those ones. 
So um, yeah, we've got our main research strength, of course, are machine learning, AI. We also, you know, uh, look into application, applied AI and optimization, and we've got uh, quite a number of, you know, uh, partnership with um, institution across the globe, including, of course, a lot of institution uh, in, in in Australia. Um, and you know, um, a, a part of my research philosophy is collaboration, and uh, I do believe that you know, collaboration is uh, what makes you research unique. So if you found these slides helpful, if you think that you've got a problem, um, you've got a, a, I mean, a, a, an optimization problem, and you're looking for a solution for that, you're looking for someone to help you, get in touch with me. I've got my contact de details in the end. Um, we've got campuses all over Australia, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, and, and Adelaide, uh, but I'm based in Brisbane. Um, but these days, I think we can uh, manage things online. So that's about a quick, you know, inter uh, introduction and overview of where I come from. Uh, what I do in my research center, and of course, as I said, uh, optimization uh, algorithms and problems have been always a part of you know my uh, career. So um, I'll be talk I'll be taking through a bit of story uh, in this uh, short presentation. Okay, I will first take you through uh, problems, uh, talk about the challenges of problems, optimization problems, different components of the op optimization problem, and once we um, understand those concepts and 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 one some of the recent methods really state of the art in those areas. Then I'll uh, take you through um, optimization algorithms overall, uh, including you know mathematical, uh, modern, or uh, stochastic methods, and so on. And one of the reasons why and a lot of people ask me uh, why do you start with optimization problem and not the algorithm? And often when I receive an email, when I talk to colleagues, uh, students, and friends, one of the first questions that they ask me is, okay, what is the best optimization algorithm in 2020, in 2021, or whatever? And to me, this is not a right question. And uh, an, an analogy that I always give them is uh, lock and key. And you might be asking why I've got a wide range of locks up here and a wide, a wide range of keys. Look, um, think about uh, it's, it's an analogy, basically. So when you have a lock, right? If, if you're locked out of your apartment, all right, you don't just ring you know, a locksmith and say, look, can you help me to, 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 to open this door? Of course, you either take your lock to the keysmith and to 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 build a, a key for you, or you bring you know the locksmith or somebody to help you. Um, and without a problem, I'm trying to say that I always look at optimization field through the lens of problem. Okay, because as 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 an algorithm developer, as an algor alg algorithm designer, okay, I'm 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 I'm, I'm a design you know algorithm to solve problems. Okay, of course. Uh, we make them as generic as possible to be applied to a wide range of problem. There's nothing wrong with that. But at, in the, at the end of the day, we need to use them for a specific a group of problems or a cohort of problems. Um, so that's why um, when it comes to, you know, uh, talking about optimization, I always, you know, emphasize the importance of problems. Because if you don't understand the problem, okay, Finding a solution um, is 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 almost useless, or at best you can find a, a solution that is less optimal. There is a bit much better solution out there for your problem. Okay, so with that being said, um, let's get started with um, uh, the beautiful field of optimization problems. Of course, optimization problems are everywhere. Okay, um, and I'm sure uh, whatever area um, that you are working on, you are trying to improve something, maximize something, minimize something. Uh, so, and even you know in our daily life when we wake up in the morning until evening, when we get go to the bed, there are so many optimization problems that we solve in our mind. When you drive your car, you're constantly finding, you know, shortest path, avoid traffic. This is all, this is all about optimization. And of course, we have some principles and algorithms in our minds, um, not just us, but also nature, you know, um, de de design and develop, you know, a lot of optimization uh, algorithms uh, or principles to solve optimization problems, okay? So optimization problems are everywhere, but the good thing is that okay, any optimization problem have uh, a, a, a set of ingredients or three main uh, ingredients that I'm going to take you through now. If I assume this is an optimization system, okay, if it, might come, it might be a simulator, it might be a problem. Let's say it's a system that we want to optimize, right? Um, it has a set of inputs. I, as you can see, I've got some arrows on the left hand side. We call them decision variables. These are the unknowns. These are the parameters that we want to find optimal values for. Things like, I don't know, the length of an aircraft wing, okay? The thickness of uh, a set, the, the diameter of, um, you know, a component in a machinery. 
it can be anything, right? It can be discrete, it can be continuous. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges uh, when it comes to the inputs, okay? So we call these inputs, or um, from now on, I'll be referring to them as decision variable, okay? So uh, the combination of the inputs will give you an output, right? Which we call them objective function or cost function. This is what you're trying to uh, maximize or minimize, right? Um, there might be multiple objectives, there might be one objective, it all depends on, on your problem. So those are the two main ingredients. Um, the, there is another one, okay, um, called constraints. Okay? Um, constraints allow us to uh, limit, you know, the solution or the search space. I'll talk about the search space in a moment, but constraints allow us to find desirable solution, right? Because the search space of, 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 an, of an optimization system, system might be infinite, uh, with constraints, we can bring that sort of expertise, um, you know, uh, we can limit that set to space uh, to find desirable solution. So the first step, so in any optimization problem, and I, I really want you to think about the problem that you have now and you're trying to, you know, optimize it. First, the first step, the very first step that I ask everyone when they approach, I say, look, uh, grab a piece of paper, list your inputs, your outputs or uh, objective functions and also constraints because that's the first step to be able to uh, formulate your optimization problem, right? As you can see up down here, I've got F in green, um, F the inputs, it's like a function, right? Um, again, this is just a simple mathematical function. There is no relationship between the input and output, but it's a generic you know, framework to start with. Subject to constraint, which means we are trying to optimize uh, the inputs to maximize or minimize the output, subject to complying with a set of constraints. OK, so now um, and, 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 and once we formulate that problem, right, once we identify those three main ingredients, that is where we can then find a solution, find an optimization algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and often an optimization algorithm is nothing more than, you know, a, a piece of code or a piece, a, 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 an algorithm, a step by step, you know, solution, how to tune the parameters of the input uh, while listening to the output and uh, the constant. OK, of course, some optimization algorithm consider the system as a black box, some consider it as a white box or even gray box. Um, some need to know the internal mechanism of the problem. Um, I'll talk about them in a moment uh, after in the second part of my uh, talk. Um, but I just wanted to show you where a big picture of, you know, optimization uh, problems and algorithm. They are hand to hand, of course, but now we, we go back to what I mentioned earlier. Having a good understanding of your problem is a stepping stone, really, to find uh, an optimization, a, a right tool, a right solution, a right key, in my analogy, for, for the problem. Now, uh, now we are we have a great understanding of uh, the uh, optimization systems or problems. I'm going to give you a hypothetical example, and uh, uh, it's a very basic example, um, but good enough to be able to visualize and have, and, and so that I can also, you know, talk about some of the uh, fundamental concepts and uh, terminologies in this field. Um, because the language that we use might be a bit different from, you know, uh, what you use in your field. And uh, I was looking uh, at the audience and I, I, we've got a few computer scientists and uh, I would assume most of you from, um, you know, other fields and mostly engineering, uh, I'd say, because of the, the chapter, of course, the scope of the chapter. Um, so, um, yeah, let's say we want to design a table. OK, it's an optimization problem. OK, there are so many objectives. There are so many parameters. There are so many constraints, um, right? So let's make it simple. Let's say we, there are two parameters to optimize. We have only length and width of this table. Don't worry about the legs. Don't worry about the thickness, the water, whether it's wooden, whether it's metal. I don't care. We don't care uh, about those. Just two parameters. Um, length and width. Uh, the range of it is from 1 to 10, uh, both of them. Okay. What is the objective? Objective, as I said, is really very basic. Um, and let's say you multiply width and uh, length. It gives you an objective function you're trying to minimize. What are the constraints? The constraints, I apply them to, to both of the length and width, but it can be applied to other aspects of the system. Let's say I don't want it to be very small, very big table. So a, a, a desirable range for me uh, as a designer of this table is, let's say, between two and seven. Okay. So now uh, with that, I mean, with, with identifying those three components, now we can formulate the problem. It minimizes F length and width. And that's a very basic equation subject to these two um, constraints. 
I've got them one slide comparing this with a real world problem. Of course, this is not even compar comparable, but it helps me to now show you uh, visualize what we are trying to achieve, you know, when we solve an optimization problem. And I really want you to, you know, uh, to, to, to extend and, 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 and take a closer look at what I'm trying to visualize here, because even an optimization problem with 10,000 variable, all right, um, follow the same principle. We have what, what we have, when we try to optimize a problem with 10,000 variables, it to me is not different from, you know, two, a problem with two variables. Of course, when you have less variables, you get less, less complexity. You have uh, you can easily visualize things. Um, but uh, but at the basic level, at the theoretical level, at the foundational level, it's very it's the same principle. And that's always my style of doing things. I always look at it. For, I always start small. Okay. So let's have a look at this. I've got a, a, a 3D box here. X axis shows the width, one of our parameters. The Y axis shows uh, Y axis shows length. And the z-axis shows that objective function. Okay, now um, I'm going to change those width and length to see what points I get in this space. We call this search landscape. Okay, what is a search landscape? It's a basic a landscape um, with uh, your parameters and the objective. Okay, it's like a mountain, mountainous area. You've got peaks and valleys. Okay, um, x and y are your parameters. So I've got a uh, four table design here when width and length are both 10 when one of them is nine or both of them is nine, okay? So this allows me to create these two four points in the search space. If I wanted to pick the best one uh, that gives me the minimum weight for now is that one down here where width and length are equal to nine both, okay? We can keep going, we can keep adding, you know, we can change these numbers. I'm using discrete values just to make it easy, but of course I can get 9.5, 9.6 and so on too. But what I'm saying is that, see, I'm changing width and length here See, so now I've got eight tables. That's where width is, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, eight and height is, uh, sorry, length is uh, eight as well. And I, I, we can keep going. So, of course, with 10 values for length and 10 values for width, we get 100 designs, 100 different uh, designs for the table that we are trying to you know, minimize it, its weight or its objective function. Okay. Um, but 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 don't, don't forget that I use discrete values, but in reality, the search space of this problem is indefinite, right? There are there is an indefinite number of solutions for this problem. But of course, the, the search space is linear. You can apply any, even the, the most basic optimization algorithm. You can employ the mo even the most basic optimization algorithm, and it will be able to easily find the best solution, which is down here. Okay. But remember, I haven't applied the constraint yet, right? Uh, it's this search space, or I should call it search landscape. Uh, the search space is only where you consider the input. Search landscape is where you consider both. Um, and what are you, what you're looking now in your on your screen is the search landscape because I've got the output and the objective too. Now, if I apply, I got a bit of issue here. This shouldn't look like this, uh, but that's okay. Um, this should be uh, skipped uh, because that's those are infeasible. But anyway, so constraints. So remember, I don't want very small or very big tables. And here we go. So with applying the constraints. I managed to find the right solution for this problem. Of course, you can look at this search space and find it by your eyes, but in the problem with more than two variables, with thousands of variables, this is impossible. Um, okay, but it gives you good, uh, you know, um, but it, it gives you enough, you know, uh, information now to, you know, um, scale this. Right. Think about a problem with ten variables. Although we cannot uh, visualize it, but uh, at the end of the day, there are, ten, uh, you know. A bunch of parameters. We are trying to find optimal values for those parameters to maximize or minimize an output. And in reality, the search space or search landscape um, is very different in real world problem. I've got another one over here, as you can see. See, this this search space is very different. We've got a lot of you know peaks and valleys. We've got a lot of locally optimal solution. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of challenges uh, that you know we face. When we uh, develop, when, when we optimize a real-world problem, okay, um, there are so many complexity here. Things like a large number of locally optimal solution, um, a small range of parameters, a large number of parameters, a large number of objectives, and so on. So, um, well, I've got a few slides on this. So I will talk about the complexities there and and some of the solutions and different subfields of subfields of optimization that you can look into, uh, depending on, of course, the problem that you are trying to solve. Okay. But again, this is the problem with two variables. I'm, I keep saying that because it allows me to visualize it for you, right? 
if I choose uh, more than two variables, um, it's hard, at least with the Cartesian coordinate system, it's hard to visualize them. You can project, of course, an n-dimensional search space to two-dimensional, three-dimensional. But again, uh, it's not as easy as this one. You look at it and it looks like a mountainous area, right, with a lot of peaks and valleys. The global optimal is here. It might be uh, some solution here better than this one, but of course, it seems the designer uh, gave us this constraint, so we want to avoid those uh, parts. Okay, so now um, I've got a few slides um, left for the first part, which I'm going to take you through the complexities that we deal with um, in each of those three components, the inputs, the outputs, and the constraints. Let's just start with the inputs or decision variables, okay? The main problem that, you know, I see people, um, you know, face um, uh, is uh, it's very common and it might be, it might resonate with you too, a large number of parameters because, you know, often when you're using a simulator, when you're using a third party application, there's a lot of optimization algorithm inside it. But when you apply it to your problem, particularly when you have a large number of variables, that is where your alg the algorithm will start to struggle. And that's because of the exponential growth of the search space, right? When I add really one more variable, um, the complexity and the difficulty of the problem is not linear. Sometimes and often the complexity increases, um, you know, um, um, ex exponentially. And that's what makes it difficult uh, to work with. Look, there is a, if, if that's your issue, there is a field of, there it's, it, these are subfields of optimization called large scale optimization, in which we, what we try to do for, these such, such, for, for such problems, we try to do a bit of, you know, um, correlation analysis to find, you know, whether some of the variables are correlated. We try to aggregate some of the variables. Basically, we try to come up with the strategies to make the number of variables small enough for the algorithm, or we push the algorithm or the computational resources that we have to be able to handle the complexity. And look, the evolutionary algorithm that I've been working on for, for many years, it's really, that's where they play, that's why every, whenever, every field that you tap on, you can find the algorithm like genetic algorithm, particle swarm, or some of the method that I develop, you will see the application because when you compare them with conventional optimization techniques, um, they outperform them, and that's because of the flexibility and stochastic nature of them. I'll talk about those uh, in a moment. Well, um, I have to, uh, a bit of disclosure here. I might be a bit biased, to be honest, here, because that's my field and not my area. Often I get mathematician, you know, uh, uh, get mad on me in the audience uh, because I keep saying, okay, these optimization algorithms are modern. That's what we use them in industry. Well, no offense to mathematical optimization techniques, all right? <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that in, in, in some problems, not all of course, um, they are uh, they have a better competitive advantage. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And of course, I, I totally agree with the fact that I'm a bit biased towards this algorithm because it's, it's, it's my passion and that's what I do every single day. Right? So variables with different range. Um, of my example, we had the same range, but your range of variables might be very different. Um, not a very significant issue, but something to be mindful of. Uh, dependency between the inputs, as I said, there might be correlation between Mixed integers and discrete variables. Some problems have uh, a discrete search space. Some problems are combinatorial, like uh, travel says my problem, which you might have heard of, or, or the, most of the logistic problems. Um, those are different, right? So we we have different algorithms, or we customize a continuous, or we adapt a continuous problem um, to be able to solve such problem. So what I'm trying to say is that, and that's, that goes back to what I stressed, uh, what I highlighted at the beginning. Look. As somebody who has an optimization problem, you have to tell me or uh, or an optimization uh, uh, you know expert. Okay, I've got this is the nature of my parameters. This is the nature of my uh, you know uh, objectives because I need to have that conversation with you. I can't you know um, give you you know a, a magical you know key and say look this is a key you can open uh, any lock with it. I need to have a good understanding of it. And fun, look, there are so many other complexities here, but what I'm quite uh, that's my main expertise, um, what I did my PhD. Um, although, you know, I haven't received, I mean, uh, the publication in this area are too specific and too, you know, narrow, too niche for a lot of academics. Um, so, um, but it's very important, okay? When you have some errors, right? Let's say I designed a table, but in, in during manufacturing process, uh, I, I wanted 10 meters or five meters, then they have 5.01. That sort of perturbation during manufacturing can result in a disaster. Right? 
think about you know critical application like airplane, aerospace. Okay, in those spaces, even 0.1% you know error in the manufacturing process will result you know a crash. Um, okay, so we the, the 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 area of study that I mean if if that's what the sort of thing that you're trying to address in your problem and your comp the complexity. You should be looking at the literature of robust optimization, and that's 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 my main expertise as uh, as uh, as uh, as a researcher. That's what I do. Um, okay, um, but the rest of it is really that uh, if you have a discrete variables, combinatorial optimization uh, or combinatorial algorithm, and these ones really large scale optimization problem or continuous optimization. Sorry, large scale optimization algorithm, I should say, or large large scale optimization overall. Now that was all about the complexity of the inputs, right? Um, use it. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean the uh, the parameters. What about the constraints? Remember, the constraints allow us to uh, limit the search space and bring that sort of expertise and what sort of solutions are desirable, what sort of solutions we are keen to get or viable. Okay. Um, going back to this slide, the one that I show you, I don't re even if this is the best solution to to that minimize the output, the designer doesn't want it for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, in the table example. Uh, this is the best table given my problem formulation, but a designer doesn't like it. So I, I don't want to find something for decision makers or designers, um, uh, something that they don't want, they don't have any application for. Uh, so constraints is, is one of the most overlooked areas, to be honest, in, 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 in the fields, in different fields that I've seen. But very important, very, very important. So what are the complexities here? As always, people have, uh, when you have a large number of constraints, the problem is that you are dealing with something like this, right? You have a, a large portion of, you know, your search space or your search landscape is uh, not desirable, right? So you, what you're trying to do is like a separated island that you're trying to, you know, it's like an ocean, right? The, the, exam, the analogy that I gave you at the beginning was an, a mountainous area. Of course, you can hike and then, you know, and, and, and find a solution. But here we are, uh, you, we are trying to hunt in an ocean with some island. So you have to cross the ocean. You have to swim from one island to the next. Again, this is just an analogy, but you get. I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Of course, the best solution is down here, uh, but think if you start from this part of the set space, you have to make all the way down, and there's no clue. You have sometimes no clue how which direction you have to take, and so on. So to be able to handle those complexity, people use penalty functions. You know, some sort of you know. Uh, assisted uh, uh, some sort of assistance to the algorithm to be able to you know um, uh, jump between different islands in, in the search landscape. Um, the, the constraints can be equality or non-equality. Again, equality constraints are very difficult to satisfy. Imagine if if you have some if something needs to be equal to something else, that significantly reduces the size of the search space or search landscape. Something to be mindful of. Uh, inequality very common. Priority of constraints. Some constraints are soft constraints, we call them, which means if you want to violate them to some extent, it's fine. It's better not to, but we can handle this. Some constraints are hard constraints, which means you, you, you must not um, you know, violate them. Again, think about a critical application like you know, airplane, aircraft, um, or any, anything to do with you know, human, uh, you know, uh, 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 human lives. Those are the sort of thing that, ha that that we need to be mindful of when when we uh, define an optimization problem. Okay, look, there is the field of the if if the, if the constraint is your challenge, if you've been struggling to handle your constraints, uh, the, the the field of study that you're looking at is called constraint optimization. And again, these are community. We've got in the IEEE, um, you know, uh, evolutionary uh, computation community. We have you know a research cluster uh, on constraint optimization. That's where we develop algorithm. We've got even Australia. We've got uh, a number of people, um, a leading researcher in that area. We've got large scale, we've got combinatorial. So those are the sort of, uh, you know, subfields that you can tap on to be able to find right collaboration, right tools, techniques, and best practices to, uh, of course, uh, solve your problem. Now let's have a look at this example. I'm going to show you, uh, remember I said uh, uh, equality constraints significantly reduces the search space. Again, don't mind the outline here, don't mind those extra surfaces. Um, I might just use my own, uh, my, my, I think this, it's, it's better, at least I don't get that. I don't think so. I'll go back to the PDF. <laughs> anyway, so look, uh, now it's, let's say I was working on this problem. Now suddenly a, a manufacturer asked me, look, we want rectangular tables, right? We don't want square shape. We want rectangular, which is where width and height are equal. 
In that case, well, the constraint is, of course, L should be equal to uh, W. And this is look at the impact on the search space. Now, all we have to do, of course, it reduces the search space significantly, which in a way will make it easier. But at the same time, in the real world search space, that's there might be other constraints, you know what I mean? You have no clue sometimes where to go because everything around you is invisible. Every every solution that you keep finding violates the condition or the constraint that uh, someone uh, give you. See now, um, uh, uh, constraints divide the search space or search landscape into two areas. We call them invisible, which is where uh, the solution is not desirable. And the other part is called feasible, right? Which is exactly where we are supposed to uh, find optimal solution inside it. Okay. Of course, depending on the number and the complexity of the constraints, you can have separation in your search landscape. You can have, you know, gaps, big gaps in your search space. And remember, this is a two-dimensional problem. Think about 10-dimensional, 30-dimensional, 100-dimensional problem. Same principle apply there. Um, they imagine uh, there will be a, a hyper plane, just like the one that you see over here. Uh, but with a large number of gaps, uh, with a large, with dominated uh, feasible, infeasible solution, I should say. So that's all. So far, we've gone through. We've got a few people join us a bit late. Um, so uh, look, we are still the first uh, early stage of this uh, this talk. We've so far we've been talking about uh, the complexity that an optimization problem and you might face as uh, uh, in in when when approaching optimization problem. We've been talking about inputs or decision variable, the parameters. We've been talking about the constraints. Now uh, I'm going to start talking about the objective. That's the another uh, f uh, favorite uh, area of mine called multi-objective optimization. Um, I've done a bit of research in that area too. I've got a couple of students who's actively working uh, in this area uh, as well. So now the first problem. Okay, I've been show, I've been talking about the one objective, right? Single objective. Look again. Think about that. This the the, the space that I show you. In a multi-objective problem, you have multiple of these, right? So yeah, that means you don't have you have not only a lot of variables, all the complexity that I've mentioned just now, but now we have another complexity, which is have which is to have multiple objective. You want to maximize lift of an aircraft, minimize the drag, um, and maximize something else. And this is an issue because the way that we approach multi-objective problems is different from uh, the way that we do a uh, single objective. Uh, and the, the main complexity, and from my own research, is the conflicting uh, nature of objective. Usually, the objectives are in conflict, right? Um, when you maximize something, um, the other thing is minimized, and vice versa. That's a very uh, a real challenge. I'll give you an example uh, in a moment. Dynamic objectives, right? What is a dynamic objective? In real world optimization problem, the search space changes over time. Think about a robot, a surveillance really system, a, a navigation system of a self-driving car, right? The search space changes in a fraction of second, right? Which means every every second in a, in T plus one, you have a different different search space. But that means you constantly need to keep track of the global optimum to be able to ensure the optimality of your solution. There's a field of study called multi-object optimization or many-object optimization, which will handle a uh, conflicting objective. The area that we work on uh, is called uh, to handle dynam dynamic or changing search space is called dynamic optimization. Um, so an area that I've been always interested. I recently just started to look into this uh, to extend one of my algorithm, uh, but mostly I've been working a lot in, in the other two uh, multi objective. And of course, you know, when you have a lot of objective, um, the problem is that, that you cannot find any solution that is better than the other. I'll show you an example in the next slide. Um, but logic optimization requires other algorithm. It, it has its own complexity. The, 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 again, these are the keywords that I give you to make your, you know, um, your search narrow when you're looking for, you know, an optimization algorithm depending on your problem. It's called many objective optimization problem or algorithm, which is where we handle a large number of objectives. Okay. To show you what I mean by the complexity of multi-objective problem, I decided to give you an example in in this slide. All right. So imagine um, now I've been asked to minimize not only the weight but also the price of this table. Again, look, don't uh, don't judge me why these equations are so simple. Look, I can I could make it so complicated, but but it's just a hypothetical example. Let's say price is a function of um, you know length and width, obviously because those are our parameters, and it's just a multiplication of those, right? So now 
the search space is different, and then we've got two, the objective arches are different. We've got two of them. Now think about it. I've got this table. I'm going to show you why we cannot use the same principles in a multi-objective uh, search space. Uh, I've got a table. One of the design is table two two kg and hundred dollar. Okay. The other table is five kg twenty bucks. Okay. When you want to try, when you're trying to you know minimize the weight uh, and the price, which one is better? Well, we don't know, right? The if you consider only weight, the first one is lighter, so it's, it's a better solution for you. But in terms of cost, it's five times more expensive than the one on the right-hand side. And that is where you cannot compare them with these relational operators. I can't say, okay, left table is better than the right table. Well, I can say that I can, I can, I can compare them if you give me some preference. If you, if you ask me, look, Ali, I wanted to design a table I, I care about price 20%, uh, I, 80%, I do care about you know, the weight. Then I try to come up with a function to combine those objectives, which, was, which is technically where I convert your multi-objective problem into a single objective. That's a different story. That's one way to handle you know, object, multiple objective. Um, but usually, I don't, as an algorithm designer, I don't have that sort of preferences. If I have a decision maker involved in a project, yes, absolutely. Um, I welcome their suggestion, but often, I'm, I try to find as many designs as possible for them so that they will decide which one is the best for which application. For example, I give them, look, this is 20 different tables that I came up with. You go and choose whatever you want. They are all best solution because we can't say which one is better. It depends on how you want to approach, you know, what sort of application. If, if you have a customer who wants something, you know, decent, expensive, made of, let's say, um, metal uh, and at the same time light, that's a good option for that customer. But this one um, is a, good, a customer, good customer for um, you know, customer with economical budget. Um, it's it's a, it's a bit uh, heavy, but that's fine. It's still uh, very cheap. So how do we compare this? There is an area. There is a parameter. There is an operator called Pareto optimal dominance that allows you to compare uh, you know these kind of tables. I'll tell you uh, how this mechan how we uh, decide which solution is better than the other in a multi-objective problem. Okay. According to Pareto optimal dominance, a solution is better than the other if it shows um, equal um, objective values in all objective and at least one better uh, in one of the objectives. Take a look at this one. Um, can we confidently say whether the left table is better than the right table? Yes. Why? Because it's lighter and cheaper. So from from a design perspective, from optimization perspective, I should say, not the design, of course, uh, the left table is better than the right table, so we can get rid of it, right? This, the right table is uh, is heavy and also cheap, uh, and, and also um, uh, cheap. So the left one, down here, I've got uh, 5 kg and $10, okay? Um, the, the, down here, I've got 5 kg and $10 again. So again, for this one, there should be a dot here. So the first one dominate, of course, uh, both of them, but these two don't dominate. Again, I think uh, the mice, they should be not dominated here because, um, hang on, uh, I think there's a bit of mistake. So they, 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 the symbol is different. I don't know when I convert it to PDF, that's what happens. But anyway, take a look at this one. Uh, this one, 5 be 5 be very equal, uh, I mean equal, and $10, $20, which one is better? Of course, the left one. Um, this one, 5 kg, 10 kg, left one is better, prices are the same. Uh, but what about these two tables? We don't know which one is better than the other. Okay, uh, again, if we pick one objective, um, that was what, that's what I was looking for. This kind of symbol. So yeah, in in a multi-objective problem, when we want to maintain the multi-objective formulation, uh, both of these solutions are good. We can't say which one is better unless we bring decision makers and we bring that sort of expertise to pick one of them, uh, depending on um, you know. If I want, for example, if I want to do this for a luxury you know, manufacturer, this is probably a good one because the quality is high, it's light. But if you want, you know, for the economical, uh, you know, manufacturer, then that's probably a good uh, solution. And look, for any of our three objective problem, there is a set of solution called non-dominated solution that, you know, uh, look like these ones on the left side, okay? So of course, if I compare, look, I want to minimize F1 and F2, right? This circle is definitely better than, you know, this rectangle, why? Because it shows better F1 and better F2. But comparing these two, not really. Um, so in a multi-objective problem, we are looking for such solutions. Of course, at the end of the day, we pick one of them based on the decision maker preferences. But for sure, as, a, as an algorithm designer, I try to find as many 
uh, as, as I can. And that's all um, everyone about optimization problem. So uh, just a quick summary, a quick recap before I, um, we move on to optimization algorithm. Uh, somebody just join us, uh, somebody join us uh, on time when we get to optimization algorithm. But anyway, so what I was saying is that, look, now we've gone through all the uh, different components of optimization problems, including uh, decision variables, constraints and objectives. Now you know the complexities. The question is, all right, what sort of algorithm out there? How we can leverage, uh, how we can harness the power of optimization algorithm to solve this, or to tackle these challenges, okay? As I said, the optimization community is, uh, is, is very broad. It, 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 we've got you know people from mathematics, people from AI, people from you know um, uh, evolutionary algorithm. It's a very you know uh, broad broad community. But the algorithm that I'm going to show you, I, I pick one from mathematics, and I'll, the rest of it are, are from evolutionary algorithm, um, which is the area that uh, uh, I've been working. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to compare them with. Uh, I'm going to uh, name these, uh, classify them into two classes, and that's where I said. Some mathematicians get, get a bit offended. Again, don't. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I apologize if I'm a bit biased here. Um, conventional, I'm referring to you know um, things like you know gradient descent algorithm, derivative-based algorithm, which of course is one algorithm out of many mathematical um, linear, mostly linear, and some nonlinear. I'm going to compare them with modern and stochastic, right? Uh, de deterministic or stochastic. There is also hybrid of both, which we call. For example, a stochastic gradient, which you might have heard of, uh, but let's separate these two because we want to see. Okay, it's a it's like a spectrum. We want to see compare each part of this spectrum and see which one is better for uh, possibly your problem. And look, if you and remember the table example that I gave you at the beginning, if this is your problem, I don't. I I would say it will be. Uh, it's like you know, uh, opening you know, or it's like opening a, a key. A simple lock with a million dollar key. Um, you don't want to say you look you for evolutionary algorithm. You can use any you know basic optimization algorithm, any mathematical optimization algorithm to solve this problem. But when it comes to these challenges, these challenging search spaces, uh, large number of variables, objective constraints, that is where um, you know modern optimization algorithm or stochastic optimization algorithm start to shine. Okay, stochastic well the gradient descent algorithm you might have heard of. It's one of the most well known. Uh, I don't know, again, my figure looks a bit uh, funny, but uh, still pretty cool, but I don't know what happened. Probably I'll uh, check my slide after I convert them next time. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to show you get gradient and descent. We know that uh, when you have a, an optimization problem, if you can calculate the gradient, if you can calculate the derivative of the search space, you can, uh, it points you towards the, uh, you know, highest slope. If you calculate the negative of it, it will point you towards the, what do you call it, the, Local optimum. In this case, if I start from here and calculate the gradient and, and follow it, it will, uh, you know, lead me to the global minimum, which is fine. And that's exactly, the, and that's why I said, if this is the problem that you're trying to solve, if if it's linear, if you don't have a lot of locally optimal solution, if you don't have a large number of variables, that's probably the best solution out there for you. But often, and and these kind of algorithm are very good in this such such spaces. Again. Make sure to think about it uh, with more variables. I've got the two-dimensional version here, which is where we have two variables and one objective. Think about more than that. Think about multi-objective. Uh, it's very efficient. And if that's if your problem is linear, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother uh, if my problem is linear. I wouldn't bother even looking into you know uh, evolutionary algorithm or other uh, stochastic methods. Okay, because it works. You know? I, I'm looking for something to to solve the problem, not really to find a fancy solution. Um, to justify the uh, having another publication, right? It's it does it does work, and I I don't want to deny it, and I don't want anyone to deny the fact that you know those algorithms do work. Of course, when it comes to such problems, when it, but for other problems, which is quite often, you know, think about your area. Definitely, you, you're dealing with some sort of uh, problem of this type, um, right? Which means you have a large number of locally optimal solution, you have a large number of variables, objectives, and so on. In that case, that's where um, the uh, evolutionary algorithm start to supersede, you know, uh, or outperform the uh, conventional or mathematical optimization algorithm. But how do we get there? Well, why? Now the question is why, you know, these algorithms are uh, perform uh, perform better. It's not rocket science, to be honest. We introduce some sort of stochastic behaviors simply 
to, to simply, um, you know, prevent the algorithm from, you know, getting trapped in a local optimal solution, to, pre to prevent the algorithm to get stuck in a certain region of the search suite that is not feasible, okay? So we call the, I call them modern, that's my way of, uh, you know, referring them, um, because, you know, they, 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 of course they are very efficient, but they are more expensive. Computationally, they're more expensive. You need more time. You need to run them uh, much longer to, to, um, to solve your problem. And that's, that's what, a, a drawback of them. Uh, but you, and they give the, the, the stochastic nature of them makes them unreliable in terms of finding the same solution each time. Okay, but I'm, because gradient descent or derivative-based algorithm usually give you the same solution unless you incorporate them, you start from different point. But usually um, that's not the case, uh, and, and that's not the case when you use them. So they are random components. So now I'm comparing these two classes of a transition algorithm, deterministic versus stochastic. What is the, the advantage of deterministic algorithm? They are reliable in finding the same solution. They require less number of function evaluation. So if your problem is very expensive, sometimes usually your stochastic methods are very expensive. There are some area uh, that we can you know, use meta model and so on. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that if it's linear and expensive, you have to use a deterministic really, unless you have some sort of other, uh, some, some other complexity uh, to deal with. Uh, fast convergence, they are quite fast. Um, they quickly converge to um, a global optimum or local optimum, I should say sometimes. Uh, what are the drawbacks? They easily get trapped in local optimum solution. They have low chance of finding global optimum. Again, low chance in, uh, in challenging real world problem. That's what I'm trying to say. High dependency on initial solution. The quality of the out, out, out uh, last solution depends on the initial point. They mostly need gradient. They're derivative base, which makes them less practical, I would say, um, uh, compared to black box optimizer. Uh, this is the first time that I use the term black box optimizer, but most of the evolutionary algorithm and swarm intelligence and etc. Uh, assume no knowledge about your search state. We assume your problem as a black box, and we always work with those three ingredients: inputs, outputs, and constraints. What are the advantages of stochastic methods? Uh, they can better avoid local solutions. Um, you can you have higher chance of finding global optimum. You have low dependency to initial solution. You have your working usually they are population based, which means uh, again which leads to better avoiding local solution. They mostly do not need gradient, but of course, just like anything on, the, on this planet or in this universe, I should say, it comes at a cost, right? We um, we compromise the a few things to be able to, of course, uh, handle the complexities. Uh, they are slower compared to, of course, gradient method, derivative-based method. They're, they find different solutions, so you need to ensure, you need to uh, employ some sort of quality assurance mechanism to make sure that this is the best solution uh, that you can get uh, with the current situation of your problem, with the resource, computational resources that you have. Okay, but to me, look, um, a lot of people ask us uh, why, you know, uh, some of these uh, optimization algorithm, evolution techniques, swarm intelligence, and so on, have become very popular. In any area you go, you can find names, uh, you can see people apply them. And the, to me, it, it, all, it all goes back to those two, those two advantages here. They are gradient free or black box optimizer. So your problem is black box to me. I don't need to look inside it. Oh, yeah, I need those three parameters to work with, right? And of course, they can better avoid. They are better for um, multi-model search space when you have a large number of locally optimal solutions. And before I wrap up, I'm 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 nearly done here. Um, a few slides on the ch other challenges that you might face. So uh, there is a, and you might be asking. Uh, there is a lot of algorithms out there. Um, which one is better? I've I've given you some tips already. How to f narrow down your search, right? Like say I'm going to only find combinatorial algorithms, so that's that will hugely reduce your search area and and you you narrow down your your search basically to find the right tool, right solution, your algorithm, your right algorithm for your problem. But again, even those areas, there are so many algorithms out there. Um, look, there's a theorem called no free lunch. If if you've done a bit of machine learning, you might have seen it before. We've got also no free lunch theorem in in optimization which is basically, which logically uh, uh, proves there is no optimization algorithm to solve all optimization problem. And that's what makes this research area very active because any new problem has new challenges. We need to tailor the algorithm. We need to develop a new algorithm to be able to handle the, uh, the complexity. Although a lot of complexity are, you know, uh, um, universal, which means you always have a large number of variables. 
you always have a lot of uh, locally optimized solution. But some, for some, for each, every single problem that, you know, I tapped on and I, I, I tackle in, in my team, I learn again something more about, you know, uh, the, the, the complexity and challenges. So every problem has its own, you know, small challenges too, which is exactly how we were and how we can help. Um, that's our job to help you to find the right, you know, algorithm for your optimization problem. Now, um, as I said, uh, we've got a lot of people uh, on this call from different backgrounds, right? Um, and I assume most of you, and, and, and most of you don't have, you know, um, background in optimization, you, but you have a problem, right? You have an engineer ca engineering case study and you're trying to find the algorithm for. Now, if you follow all the advice that I've, uh, uh, my humble advice is over uh, on this, uh, in this presentation, you can narrow down your search but there's a, a, a few other you know, uh, challenges that you might face, which is often um, your role is to find really a right tool and also just find something, you know, uh, I would say connect or what you call adapt the algorithm to your problem and, and employ it to solve your problem. But there are a lot of technical issues. Most of the simulators have simple optimization toolboxes, right? Um, so that means those optimization algorithms are not efficient and usually they get stuck in a local optima. And it's not easy to replace them with, for example, uh, a particle swarm optimization or genetic algorithm. So what I'm trying to say is that um, that's the sort of challenge that sometimes PhD student, postdoc student, postdoc, you know, uh, researcher face. They get stuck, and that's because of that sort of, you know. So often we help them to to uh, we help them to to do that sort of, you know, uh, connection. So how we can then use our optimization algorithm for uh, that sort of toolboxes. We need to uh, employ better recent optimization algorithm in this case, of course, which is not easy. Uh, easy to, of course, apply to the problem, but when it comes to those two boxes, that's where it uh, becomes a bit difficult because you need to understand how those simulator and two boxes work. There are many issues in connecting MATLAB to simulator. Look, I've been using MATLAB and, you know, we researchers love MATLAB. Um, or that's basically because it's free, we can use it through our university license. That's one way, but that's not the case in, in, in industry, of course. Um, and, and, and MATLAB is user friendly, easy to use. There's a lot of toolboxes, but the issue is that you cannot easily connect MATLAB to a simulator. So that means there's, there's a bit of you know technical challenge here that I found sometimes the main challenge for a lot of people. They know, okay, I said uh, genetic algorithm is the best tool. Somebody recommended it to me, and it seems the right tool. But how can I now apply it to the simulator? That's also a challenge uh, that you have to deal with the technical challenge. And since the optimization uh, algorithm that I've been talking about requires a large number of simulations, it is necessary to run simulator in parallel, which again, do, depending on the license, you are not allowed to do that. That sort of technical challenges that sometimes PhD students start, you know, uh, work on for six months of their PhD, to be honest, uh, just to get there, just to, to be able to start, you know, doing conducting experiments. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, that's normal. I mean, any project that you're working on, as I said, there are so many challenges in terms of problem, but these are some technical challenges that I always remind people. So don't be pissed off if that's what you are dealing with now. It's, it's, you know, it's the nature of, you know, different systems, you know, different programming languages, different simulators. It, this is something that we need to really work around. Uh, to get. And look, I think that's all really I wanted to cover uh, uh, for this talk. Um, well, thanks a lot. I know uh, this is Friday evening for everyone. Uh, but, uh, and um, just before uh, we finish uh, and I take some questions, I, I would like to, uh, you know, thank again um, for, for your invitation. Uh, it was my pleasure, you know, to share this. And again, I've got a small website. Um, you can get in touch with me um, if you have, if you're looking for a, some sort of collaboration, if you're looking for, um, if you have a problem and you have no idea how to tackle it, uh, we've got, you know, expertise. Um, I've got people, you know, in my team and of course in my international network who I can connect you with. Um, I've got all my source codes are online. If you go to my website, you can easily download them. Um, and hopefully, I really hope that you can, you found this, uh, you know, presentation helpful. And I would love to take some questions uh, if you have any. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Yazdani, over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mirjali, for your very interesting, insightful presentation, given us a new angle of vision to the optimization problems we want to face. And now it's time for the audiences to share, uh, you know, their questions with you. I think we recently received two 
questions in the you know chat box. If you can please start with these two questions, and then uh, you know feel free to ask your question yeah. uh, around the optimization problems, and Dr. Amir Jalili will answer to you. Yeah. Cheers. So Thank got, you. I can, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. I can see some questions in the chat window. I can answer them, uh, uh, and that's okay. And then we can some take some more questions. So I think Kiran asked uh, a new optimization algorithm can be implemented in deep learning models. Look, uh, again, any sort of learning algorithm is an optimization problem, right? Um, if you think about, you know, back propagation, um, we calculate derivative. That's, we are using, you know, uh, some sort of gradient descent algorithm or gradient based method, derivative based method, all right? Um, so look, uh, as I said, the evolutionary algorithm that I'm talking now, um, assume your problem as a black box, whether it's deep learning, multi-layer perceptron, whether any sort of problem, you can apply them. But remember, um, the runtime is a lot slower, so you need to be mindful of that. Um, if you can train your network and use it offline later on, I would say yes, you can give it a try. Um, and that's if, if, if BP backpropagation and those simple optimization algorithms struggle, you can apply, replace them with another optimization algorithm. So absolutely. Uh, but if it's a real time, you know, if it's like a, a live, you know, like, uh, like it's after I've been called, you constantly, you know, try to, you know, detect, you know, obstacle, pedestrian roads and so on. For that areas, I think at the moment with the current technology, it's really, uh, we are not there yet. Um, all the, uh, I mean, um, unless you use some sort of, you know, parallel computing, uh, you can do that. Now, hopefully that was your question. Is in, and this is a second question of Kiran, I think. In neural network model, generally we use steepest descent. Can we use genetic algorithm? It's instead, you can. Look, I've got a book, you can get in touch with me. I've got a uh, book uh, called Evolutionary Algorithms and Neural Network. And I've got a chapter um, that I've, I've applied, I've employed a bunch of algorithm to uh, in deep learning models. Um, absolutely, that's something you can. And uh, yeah, so if you want that book, um, it's uh, just send me an email. I'll be happy to share, uh, give you a copy, a free copy. And anybody else, not just Kiran, to be honest, anybody else, if you get in touch with me, I'm happy to give, uh, give to you a free copy. I've got it online. All right, so now, uh, Dr. Kashif is saying, do CEC 17, 18 represent real world problem if my algorithm solves CEC function? Does it mean that it will solve real world problem? That's a good question, uh, 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 Kashif. And I'm glad you asked. Remember the, the, one of the last slide I said, uh, the no free launch theorem. Look, this is hard to say. I would say if your algorithm uh, provide a competitive advantage on those competition and you can outperform other algorithm, you've got a pretty good chance, strong case to publish it. And you've got a, you've got a very uh, promising algorithm to be applied to real world problem. Yes. But again, look, those uh, test functions are very generic, right? Um, there are a lot of test bets uh, in, the, in the optimization community. People make them as challenging as possible, but again, they are not even comparable to some of the real world problems that I've been working with, I've been working on, to be honest. As I said, the complexity that you face in real world problem is not even comparable to those benchmarks. But don't get me wrong, look, the reason why we have those test functions because we know how the search space looks like, we know where the global optimum is, so of course we can measure the performance of an algorithm and compare them, right? It's like, you know, uh, it's like a racetrack. If you know the rest track, then that's how you can train your algorithm. You can improve your algorithm because you know the path, you know, you know, um, ups and downs of the track. Um, so you don't want to, you know, of course, train in darkness and then suddenly jump into the actual race, right? <laughs> so yeah, um, if you manage to, um, you know, outperform other algorithm in CEC 17 and 18, um, well done. I mean, you've got a strong case there. And for for the, for the rest of the audience, uh, CEC 17 and 18, those or benchmark suites, uh, mathematical optimization problems, as I said, with known global optimum, there are like test beds. It's like data set, you know, in UCI machine learning, you know, repository, it's exactly like that. We've got optimization problems uh, dedicated to uh, the community of, uh, the optimization community to be able to test and compare their algorithm. Any other question? Um, Thank you very much for your uh, answers. Yes, please, please feel free to ask your questions. Oh, thank you so much. It's very nice of you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Yes, you can turn on your mic if you like and you ask your questions and Dr. Mirjali will answer them. 
And, and Dr. Yazan, it's Friday evening, so I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, <laughs> so, I see. look, yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, if you have any question, let me know. And look, um, just um, you can find my email online. I'll be happy really to answer any sort of questions. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me anytime. I'll be happy to keep this conversation going. And once okay. again, thanks a lot for your invitation, Dr. Yazan. And Sorry, if there is a yes. question, uh, sure. somebody has raised the of his, her hand. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Maria. Hello. Hello, Maria here. Yes, Maria. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting. No uh, well, I've been working uh, on application of evolutionary algorithm algorithms to uh, electromagnetic problems. Yeah. Uh, it was my PhD, and now I I doing something else, but I still keep reading the literature. Yeah. So I have an impression that artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks. Uh, are seen as a future of optimization and evolutionary algorithms have this bottleneck of the long time of uh, uh, solution time. So would you agree with this or they have the both uh, places in in solving optimization problems? Yeah, so just just to, to, to clarify, I just want to see if I can, uh, if I understood your question uh, well. So um, are you now comparing machine learning and uh, deep learning with optimization and see which one uh, plays a more important role, or um, the relationship between the two? So, uh, I've seen machine learning apply to optimization problems. Yeah. And rep the reports say that the solve problem is pretty quick, as yeah. opposed to the evolutionary algorithms that take time. Of course, yeah. yeah. They, they uh, I agree. die out. Yeah, I agree with you. Look, um, and and look, um, a lot of machine learning techniques are, uh, you know, the uh, the algorithm, let's say, uh, deep um, MLP or a single even perceptron, they have some sort of learning method, right? They've got uh, a very basic and derivative based, um, you know, technique uh, learning method, which is quite fast. And if you look at TensorFlow online, um, you can see if even you know high dimensional problems can be solved, right? Um, and absolutely, if, if time is important um, and, and you want to quickly find the answer, mainly for real time uh, application, absolutely. But look, and, and but evolution algorithm, you know, for the problems that we have, first of all, time, of course, to, to find a, a better solution. And second of all, the problem that, you know, have a large number of variables, and that's where I would say when a, a, a mathematical optimization algorithm or any machine learning techniques start to struggle, um, that's where you can think of using evolution algorithm. And uh, look, evolution algorithms is going to be around. I mean, I know, um, you know, because of the computational resources that we have, uh, because of the technology uh, and Moore's law uh, uh, increasing the uh, power of the machine, um, other techniques are becoming, you know, more popular. But you know, evolution algorithms are. Uh, I don't see them fading away in future, unless, to be honest. <laughs> The biggest threat is quantum computing. If there is going to be, you know, uh, some sort of, you know, hardware in future, and that's my always, uh, it's not a nightmare, it's not a dream, it's something in between, right? If there's going to be a quantum computer that allows us to do any sort of brute force search method in a fraction of a second, then there is no point of having any sort of evolution algorithm. You understand, uh, Maria? So, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, so. But at the moment, with the existing technology, simply because of the complexity, because of the limitation that we have, I would say uh, not long. Uh, still, we have uh, quite some time to get there. But again, yeah, who knows what happens? It really, I mean, we reach to the edge of the hardware now. Even looking at the machine learning, I think, so neural network. I assume I my my feeling and uh, my sense is that in future we're going to have hardware dedicated for neural network. So we've got perceptron dedicated hardware for that. Um, so we are at the edge of, you know, having that sort of limitation of the hardware, which is always, of course, the case. Um, so I hope that uh, that was a, a, a good discussion. Yes, thank you. No worries, Maria. Um, there's a question, Kiran, again. And Colony, I'm writing in C language. It's a little difficult and easy way. Look, I've never done it in C. I've done it in MATLAB, so, and you can find it in my website. I, I, if I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen any C implementation, but it should be somewhere out mm -hmm. there, so... Keep an eye, and if I found something, um, I'll probably share it uh, link to my website. So, but at the moment, it's not at the, at the top of my mind to give you the link. But good luck with that, Kiran. I hope you will eventually implement it in C. Um, Thanks again for your answers. 
So if there is any more questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, my name is uh, Farhad Shahniel. Thanks very much uh, for your very excellent uh, presentation today. I, I do. Well, first, I, I really enjoyed the talk that you had. That was very great. Uh, I do have a question coming from a separate angle, and that is mainly talking. I believe that you are already uh, editor or reviewer for different journals and you review manuscripts that come to those journals. I just want to ask you about your experience uh, about uh, the types of the optimization techniques that are being used in those journals. I mean, I'm from field of electrical power engineering, and uh, I'm seeing that there are sometimes I'm receiving so many manuscripts to review, which they have simply tried to employ a specific and very well-known objective, uh, sorry, optimization solver to solve an existing problem, which has been already dealt with different types of uh, different types of uh, solvers or optimization algorithms as well. Uh, which, frankly speaking, I don't see that they are really adding any contribution to the science because we we have already tried different types of algorithms and this is now just simply adding one. I want to see that from your angle. How do you see that? I mean, I assume that you are also very similarly receiving many manuscripts to review, either as editor or re reviewer. How do you see that uh, uh, the, the way that the people are employing some yeah. algorithms uh, in that aspect. I mean, I have no objection if people are really coming up with new uh, algorithm to solve a problem or they are really proposing a new algorithm, but this is not what I see. And sometimes they only focus on that as the key contribution of their work. Uh, that's a yeah, good thanks. question. No, Th that's a great question, Farhad, and I'm glad you asked this. And uh, and it's, it's, it's our issue too, and you are right. And simply, you know, applying, uh, employing a new algorithm to a new, to a problem, is a contribution, but it's not authentic. You know, it's just okay. I applied this algorithm; it gave me a result. Look, now I have to look at this from two perspectives, right? Uh, in the journal that I'm editor of and I'm involved, we we uh, we would expect, you know, author to have also a, a good, you know, an in-depth analysis of the algorithm, right? If I apply, let's say, a new algorithm, I don't want to mention any name. Let's say X algorithm, which is new. I apply to this problem and it works, okay? And then say, okay, this algorithm is better, suddenly conclusion, <laughs> and then that's it. I, I always get them, look, um, to, to to reason it. Okay, can you explain why this algorithm worked better, okay? From the algorithm perspective, okay? So, um, and then um, how you get there, okay? what? So now you apply this algorithm to this problem. Can you, can people apply to the same area? Is it going to be, uh, a, a good, a reliable algorithm compared to, as you said, uh, beautifully mentioned, there are other algorithms people have been working for many years. Okay, is it, is it sustainable? Is it scalable? So that's so. If if an author, if a group of author give me that strong, you know, reasoning at the end and show the projection of future, I'm happy to give them a chance. To be honest, because they demonstrate, you know, it's just I apply this algorithm to this problem and bam, here's the result. They show that sort of critical thinking. They and that's a contribution to the field, both problem area and algorithmic area, right? Because often, as I said, I look at pro optimization field through the lens of problem. Okay, I said that's a problem. This is a, the, the algorithm that we develop or propose or adapt or tune, and this is the reason why it happens. And this is uh, the future of this algorithm. So that is how I approach it. The, the story is a bit more challenging uh, in your case, probably because. You are now overseeing uh, a lot of manuscript in application area, right? So I would say maybe you can use my our approach and get the author, you know, to reflect on their, you know, journey on their algorithm. Okay, if you tune genetic algorithm or if you hybridize genetic with something else and you develop, okay, what's the purpose? Um, why do you think that this is going to be a good, a sustainable solution for this problem? Okay. If it can justify it, I think they've got a good understanding of why uh, they've done it. It's just not, I would say, it's not a justification for having another publication. It's an authentic contribution. Uh, that means they've justified their decision, the choice of the algorithm, the choice of the methodology, the choice of, you know, the, 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 the way that they approach uh, the, the problem. Uh, but you yeah, look, this is, uh, yeah, I think um, that's all I can think of at the moment, but that's how I would approach it. And hopefully that will be, that was helpful for you too.
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I fully agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very All much. Right. Thanks. Thanks again, Dr. Mirjalili, for answering to the Farhad's question. Uh, we just uh, asking for the last call. If there is any more question, feel free to ask. So I think there is another one. Yeah, and, and Mario made a fair point. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it is OK to apply. She said it is OK to apply known evolution algorithm to the problem. Just the comparison should be systematic. And often, yes, because of the stochastic nature of them, you look, make sure, and that's a fair point. Uh, we usually expect them to statistically you know, analyze it because if you run an algorithm once and compare it, it might be by chance, right? So it's not really a reliable comparison. So statistical tests, Wilcoxon, t-test, student tests, and over whatever, depending, of course, the null hypothesis, um, th those, that's, that's where they can have a stronger case. Say, uh, my contribution or my solution to this problem is substantially better than others because of these p-values, you know what I mean? Because I reject another hypothesis. And that's a fair point on Maria as well. Um, Thank you very much again. One more questions. Look, there is a yeah, there's a question. Uh, is there any convergence analysis of PSO? Um, yes, I've seen. Um, you mean the experimental analysis? Yes, that's easy. But if you're looking for mathematical analysis of the convergence, I I, I think I've seen. Um, I've never worked in that area to be honest. Uh, but there should be. I think an article transaction on evolution and computation, or maybe a CEC conference. I've seen a paper maybe a few years ago. But uh, there should be there should be analysis convergence of PSO out there. Um, all right. So any other questions? I think Hi Bank, my colleague at Berdak, has a question. Hello, hello, uh, Amir. Thanks, thank you, thank you for introducing me. Uh, thank you, uh, many thanks, Ali. Professor Ali for giving okay. us very, you know, excellent, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, presentation regarding the optimization, yes, and uh, algorithms. And because uh, I'm not that, you know, expert in optimization, because the I'm uh, similar to, you know, my colleague Amir. We are doing some researches on control and uh, control theory and applications. So I'm considering because in some of the control you know, uh, related research papers. They are trying to use the uh, optimization techniques combined with the control methodologies to, you know, uh, to optimize the control parameters and etc. So, but some of, uh, as I, you know, uh, see from the, observe from these papers. So most of the papers, they are only doing offline optimize, uh, optimization for those, you know, parameters. So uh, is any possible way to do the online optimization for those parameters. Yes, for the control uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, thanks a lot, and that's a good question. Look, you can, uh, we can, uh, for sure, we can use uh, evolution algorithm online, uh, but there must be some strategy behind it. It depends on the uh, the the cost of your objective function, how long it takes each time you give the input, um, and it gives us an output. If it's like a fraction of second, it's our bread and butter. We don't have to be concerned about you know. Yeah. Algorithm, how many you know population size? What's the population size? But if it's expensive, then that's a different story. Yes. Usually, what we do, we try to. Um, it's we we are now dealing with double optimization problem. It's called hyper heuristic or hyper uh, optimization, which is where we we will try to find optimal population size. You know what I mean? And also the iterations and the the evolution process, in which we. Uh, we reliably converge to a solution in reasonable time that you would expect, whether one minute, whether one second, half a second, it depends on your control problem, of course. It's a yeah. possibility, but of course, it's a challenge. Yes, um, exactly. And, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah because I'm, uh, I'm doing, I'm working on the electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles as well. So for those cases, if we apply the, you know, optimization based control methodology for those, you know, uh, real time systems. <laughs> So if the you know uh, the time is you know considered as a main factor, yeah. which will you know greatly <laughs> limits the you know application of the optimization based control methodology. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
So, so yeah, as I said, uh, look, there should be a strategy around this. Sometimes parallel computing will help, and not sometimes, always really. It really depends on you know the machine um, mm -hmm. that use the computational resources that you have available. Yes, on the yes. algorithmic side, we can help to you know to find a, a, an optimal configuration, a quick mm -hmm. algorithm, yeah. um, you know, uh, good enough, uh, and and, and to, to converge to a solution. Whether mm -hmm. not the best, but something reasonable yeah. uh, in a short period of time that you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So. Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ali, for your uh, intuitive you know no explanations. Worries. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Wang. Cheers. My pleasure. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali, for the, again, interesting and insightful presentation. And thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, IES webinar. I hope you enjoyed, like me. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope to you see you in the uh, next one. Thank you very much again. And have a good time, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone, and Thank have you. a great weekend. Bye. Thank you, everyone. See you. Have a good weekend. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.